All right, it's January, and a lot of you are just getting started on your fitness journey, or maybe you're restarting. Well, check this out. What kind of body do you want? Do you want a soft body without much muscle, flabby, hormone imbalances, slower metabolism? Do tons of cardio. If you want a body that's hard, chiseled, sculpted, a faster metabolism, and hormones that are balanced, lift weights. Strength training is superior in a head-to-head -head competition when it comes to aesthetics and even overall health. Now, I am oversimplifying, but if you're only going to pick one, make it strength training. What I if you're this. hard and also a little soft? You know what I mean? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where to go with that. <laughs> Just half of me <laughs> and the other half. Oh. Just want to be huggable, but also By hard. Way, you know, every, uh, every gym owner... Or anybody who's worked in gyms for years knows this. Can see this. You, I could, I could tell by somebody. Let's say you have two people that come in. They're, and like they're both fanatics. fit. Both are fit. Both are both are in good shape. Good low, diets. Yeah, good diets. Low body fat percentage. And I hundred percent can see. And they could be like they said, same weight. They could look very very similar in size and weight or whatever like that. But it's very obvious to which one has achieved that body through doing lots of cardio versus the person who's achieved it through strength training. It's like they look completely different. It's totally, yeah. I, I, yeah. I remember as, so as an early trainer, I mean, I, I thought for a long time, I thought the way to get lean was cardio. The way to build muscle and strength was to lift, lift weights. This is what we all thought in mm -hmm. those days. And, um, you know, when I started to work in a gym, you know, you're there a lot, right? Especially I, I was there all, all, all the time. I loved it. So I was there you know, 7 a.m., I'd leave at 9 p.m., you know, six, seven days a week, and you just start to see patterns. And I'd notice these, like, regular members that would come in that would be on cardio. Mm -hmm. And I mean regular, like clockwork, 6 a.m., same people on the treadmill or on the elliptical, you know, four or five days a week. Like, these were the consistent maniacs. And then I saw the consistent people that would lift weights, both men and women. And it started to become very obvious to me. I'd see these, like, you know, we call them cardio bunnies back then, uh, and they were typically women, but you'd see this with guys too, where they would just hop on cardio. They would do an hour, an hour and a half. Some of these people were in there running straight for an hour, five days a week. And their bodies looked like their body fat percentage wasn't that great. They kind of looked flabby. They had great stamina. Obviously they were, they were really good at, right. at building stamina. And then the strength training crowd looked so different. They were chiseled. Mm -hmm. Uh, they had good shape and structure, better posture. They looked, and I dare I say younger, uh, cause there were a lot of these people were in there were, you know, 40 plus 50, a lot of them, they looked younger and this became very obvious. The longer I worked in gyms the more I could see the difference in training. Now, of course you have to compare apples to apples. Like, can you be fat and lift weights? Can you be lean and do yeah, Absolutely. So all things being equal though, the strength training promotes lean body mass and burns body fat. Cardio promotes stamina actually also can promote the reduction of lean body mass to become so that you could become more efficient with calories. Um, there was a recent study that came out that compared, I've already mentioned this twice, but it's a crazy study. They compared strength training to cardio to cardio and strength training. So they actually made three comparisons. It was strength training <clears throat> alone, cardio alone, and then cardio plus strength training. Strength training by itself. Yeah. Wins. Burned the most body fat and built muscle. Cardio alone lost muscle and some body fat. Cardio plus strength training lost body fat and lost less muscle than the cardio, but, but build, but didn't build muscle like the strength training. See, it's interesting. And, and I'm glad like a study like that was, was uh, conducted, but like, we didn't need that. Like we saw that firsthand, like you're talking about, like in, and I really do see that as like, we don't put enough weight and value in, um, just being in the gym environment and being able to see how all these methods play out. Like yeah. th this literally is right in front of us. I know it's anecdote and I know it's like, doesn't hold that like high scientific standard, but it's just, that's why I've always had, I've always had an issue with like some of these isolated studies that like really try to like pinpoint, uh, one of those like factors of like, you know, cardio versus lifting weights. It's like, well, let's see how this plays out long term. And you can see world. this a lot with all the members right in front of you. Yeah. I mean, we didn't need that, but the general, I mean, the it, general public. Needs yeah. That. Like we, we knew better and stuff like that, but I, I was going to ask, what do you think you guys has led? So we obviously saw that, right? We saw tons of these, these cardio bodies, uh, and uh, were a, probably a higher percentage of people than the the strength yes. training bodies, right? What do you think the major contributor or factor to that is? Like, why? I know it's 
I know it's multifaceted. I know yeah. it's not just one reason why that is, but what do you think are like the, the major contributors to what caused that? Do you think it's just purely uninformed? Do you think? Oh, that, why more people? Yeah, why, we why saw more? Or, of a yeah, cardi- yeah. Because oh, yeah. I mean, you, you, you make a good cardi- point right now. It's like yeah. let's just look at it. Yeah. We don't need a study. Look at it over a year's time. It's very obvious. Okay, if it's very obvious, and we didn't even need a study to do that, why? Why did so many people go that? How is how is fitness portrayed? A fit, healthy body. How is that portrayed in media? Hmm. It's not lifting weights. Yeah. So you're going the it's, direction that I think. Yeah. I, th- I think it's a cultural thing. hundred percent. Yes. hundred percent. It was, it's a uh, cardio is what you do to be fit and lean and healthy. And it's been promoted that way. The only time you see strength training in media was for meatheads or extreme steroid bodies or bodybuilders or yes. whatever. It was never like the kind of like, especially for women, by the way, the kind of body that women want fit, lean, sculpted, nice glutes, hamstrings, like not overly masculine, whatever. That's the body you achieve with strength training. That's the body they display on media that they attribute to cardio. Yeah. They'll show a body yeah. like that on a movie and it's the woman running long distance. And that's what she, that's, oh, that's well, why she looks I think initially is. too in gyms, like there was sort of that like subculture within the gym where it was like the crazy meathead guys only in the weight room, you know? Yes. And so th- there was a little bit of that idea that like, oh, this is just for them. Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to just, you know, be healthy and, and do things that like promote health. And I think that walking and running and like, you know, uh, reducing calories and things like that were, were like ideas that were promoted culturally that are healthy in comparison to these crazy, you know, they're taking drugs and, you know, they're, they're like, uh, you know, all football players and all like bodybuilders. It does feel like there's, there's been a major culture shift. Huge. I mean, the, the Huge. fact that we, it wasn't even, but a few months ago, uh, heard the term muscle mommy for the first time I know. You know? Yeah. and heard it multiple times in one day. It was just like, oh, wow, this is interesting. Like, this is not something that I'm used to hearing from clients that are inquiring about getting in shape or losing weight like that. Oh, I want to look like a muscle mommy. Mm-hmm. Like that's you never heard that before. Like, in fact, I remember clients actually like being like, no, I, I don't want muscular yeah, afraid. arms. Yeah. Afraid like I don't want, I don't want muscular I arms. I just, I want them to look Believe it or not, thin and skinny. It's people like, wow. don't even realize how much it's already changed. Uh, I mean, when I was in gyms in the late '90s, early 2000s, uh, I would actually get men that would say that. No, 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 I don't want to lift weights. I don't want to get too big. <laughs> and I remember, being like, <laughs> I would hear that and laugh. Whoa, like, whoa, whoa, whoa! Okay, yeah. buddy. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not. I don't want to look Let's like a bodybuilder. Yeah. Listen, bro, you're not going to look like a bodybuilder. <laughs> Go lift weights all you want, but it, it's definitely cultural. Now, culture, media really plays a big role in what people believe to be true. Um, and the, the the whole cardio revolution, I mean, it's really clear what started that. I mean, you had this kind of perfect storm, right? You had- We need a documentary. You had that book. Mm-hmm. Um, what was that book? I always mention it. I always running Revolution. Not Running Revolution. No, uh, it was um, the- uh, Born the, to Run. No, it wasn't Born to Run. It was like uh, the running- Yeah, let me look it up. I don't remember. Anyway, the it's got Running a, Revolution. Yeah, you'll find Jim it. Jim Fix was his name, I think. Yeah, look it up. It was 1970-something, right? And it, it was a picture. It's like a red running shoe and a foot. The Complete Book of Running. Thank you. James mm-hmm. Fix. That book okay. became a bestseller. At the same time- one of the biggest cultural icons of a movie was released, Rocky. And what does he do? He runs. And that just inspired everybody. Mm-hmm. And you had this running revolution. Marathons exploded. If you look up the history of this, like marathons exploded, running shoes exploded. It wasn't just people in LA that were running. All of a sudden, people are running all over the country. You think this Rocky really played that big of a role? Huge. You don't think so? I don't know. I just think that you, oh, I, you oh, find I, a way to tie everything to rock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do, but this part's true. <laughs> I mean, I, I, it's I the did greatest see, yeah, romance yeah. movie in the world. <laughs> now it's the greatest running movie <laughs> for, of all for time. Young men what and else, boys, bro? I mean, first of all, greatest action love movie, story. greatest love story, and now opinion. it's the greatest running movie ever made. Doug, Doug look up, look up uh, Rocky's <laughs> influence on uh, the on the running. Um, you could put up running revolution. This doesn't count if it's an article you wrote. We got to throw in myself drinking. Like Who does that? And Cry- and CrossFit well, yeah. does that. Cites all their own articles. I know. Yes. <laughs> they do, start, huh? We can start doing that. <laughs> yeah. We'll make our own studies. Yeah. <laughs> According to me. No, so, uh, no, I did a lot of reading about this. And if you look at the popularity of like running shoes and just culturally, it, it kind of exploded. Strength training is having that movement now. It's starting to happen now. Strength training, the, the you know, you had muscle beach movies in the 60s, which literally depicted people who lifted weights as idiots. Mm-hmm. Like bi- not only idiots, narcissistic body obsessed idiots. You ever watch those old movies? Have you ever yeah, seen yeah, them? Yeah. 
literally, it shows them flexing, oiling themselves up. Like blundering idiots. And then looking in the mirror and looking at each other. It was Ooh. almost like a, it was, yeah. it was yeah, hilarious. Yeah. There was that. And then uh, pumping iron, which is like, it's pro bodybuilding. It's as extreme as you can get. And that was it. So there was no, and then in the eighties, what was it? Arnold, Sylvester Stallone, you know, and you know, those are extreme bodies. Yeah. So, and it might've got some guys to lift weights. It did for me, Sure. but uh, it wasn't, it wasn't the, you know, the, the cultural shift that strength training needed. Andrew, now luckily we have studies. Andrew Duck, can you guys, find, I'd love to see the, the stats on gym attendance the last decade. Like what is, what does gym attendance look like in the last 10 years? Yeah. Are we, are we trending up? Are we, are we maintaining? Is it, do, well, is it, is it I, like what we see in our business where it's like, you kind of find this place where you're hovering and uh, it, as many people are falling off or coming mm -hmm. back on, is it, are we just kind of maintaining the the amount of people? What do you think? What do you guys think? I think it's gone up. Yeah, gym memberships have gone too. up. I think it has. But uh, no, that's not gym attendance. Yeah, yeah so attendance. I don't know about attendance. Yeah, but yeah. memberships have gone up. So yeah, you know why we're selling more people, but they've made it also really, really inexpensive. I mean, Dude. I mean, I, you could make, uh, what, what's it called? Um, uh, what's the purple one? What's oh, it? Planet, <laughs> Fitness. Planet, Planet Fitness. Planet Fitness is is Barney? is damn near uh, responsible for that by themselves. Prince. Listen, in 1997 <clears throat> or eight, 98, I think when I when I really started in the in the gym, I worked at a 24 hour fitness. At the time, they had 74 locations. They had just merged with uh, with Ray Wilson's Family Fitness, so they didn't they weren't 400 locations. So 70 something locations, a lot. You could, the all club, and remember this is 1998, not controlled for inflation. I'm giving you the $1998. If you bought an all club membership, 24 hour fitness, I remember it like it was yesterday because I sold them. It was $249 to join, yeah. a $49 processing fee, $45 a month. That was 1998. Yeah, that's high. Yeah. You, you, Planet Fitness all club membership was like nine bucks. Yeah, they, just, they, had like a, they have like a zero enrollment, zero everything right yeah. now. It's super cheap. Because yeah. they, they sell memberships and they expect people to keep them and not show no, up. No, it was like one of the most brilliant business models ever, let's yeah, be honest. Terrible for, I mean. Yeah, it, it's so yep. funny. It's like, how do you, how do you, uh, I mean, how do you rally your, your company, your team, right? Yeah. Like, you get all these GMs, you guys yeah. like, all right, you guys, let's go change lives. But really, we're not trying to do yeah. that. You know, saying, like, Shh, really, what we're trying to do is just I've talked about feed this, them some pizza and keep them coming home. back. Bro, yeah. I can't tell you that I had this, like... The irony of that, right? Oh, so I've talked about this so many times before, but I remember the moral struggle. There was, like, this internal... Because as a young kid working in the gyms, we were also very motivated to produce and sell. It was like mm -hmm. this crazy environment. You guys know, you, you, know, you guys oh, yeah. know this. It was insane, especially. That's how I feel about supplements yeah, too. Especially yeah. late nineties, early two thousands. It was like boiler room. It was crazy. Right? Yeah, very car dealership like. But there was also the training side. The fitness side was also very like we want to get people fit. I came from the fitness side, moved into sales, but back then nobody crossed over. So I moved to the sales side, and it was all about the money there. The trainers they'll handle the, the fitness, but the sales guys were trying to sell. So now I'm on the sales guy side and I remember going to a meeting. I've talked about this before and it, it like, oh, so I was so, um, torn. Yeah. It was like such an internal <laughs> struggle. They literally listed what kind of members we profit off of and what kind yeah. of members we lose money off of. And I remember I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh, okay. You know, and I, my initial thought would have been like, oh, the members that use the gym the most are going to be the profitable ones. Cause whatever. And I didn't even think about it really. If I thought about it, I think I would have figured this out. And I remember them saying, People that use the gym three or more days a week consistently cost us money because they wear the equipment down, they pay their monthly dues, and that's it. The ones that make us the most money are the ones that pay their dues and don't show up. And then I remember this feeling inside of me, like, part of me was like, whoa, good business idea. The other side of me was like, wait a minute. Well, think about that's that. That's a weird incentive. We're not actually helping. Yeah. You're, you're, you're selling people the dream of getting in shape, being consistent, but you're also betting that they won't or follow hoping. through. Yeah. You're betting on it, or also it'd be a terrible business model, <laughs> right? So you're you're so how You'd create mass capacity. So think about that for a second. It's like we're going to create this business model. The idea is this: is we're going to we're going to rally people, we're going to motivate them to come and try and change their lives and be consistent and use our gym. But secretly, we know they're probably not going to, and that's why we're going to be successful. Now here's the that's I, now here's the, when you think here's about the it. case yeah. that I used to <laughs> and I used to try to make this case, uh, and I I'm, I don't know if I'm right or not, but I saw this with with training. And you guys went through the same thing. I remember thinking to myself, God, if if I really taught people in early days, I remember thinking like, if I really taught people like truly how to do this for the rest of their lives on their own, they're not going to work with me anymore. They won't need me anymore. 
and I'll lose clients. Mm -hmm. But then I thought, you know what, you know, I, I care about people so much. And, you know, over the years I got better at it. And then what I learned was, is if I actually help people in real ways, I become more successful as a trainer. It's not what you think. No. So I think if gyms really, <sighs> if there was like a, we need a leader, we need a leader in the gym industry to be like, yeah. here's the deal. It is expensive. Here's all our success stories, but we're yeah. going to get you there. Like we're not just, we don't want you to not yes. show up. We want you to show up. We want to really make, and I want them to prove that that model can work. Cause right now the opposite is true. The model is the planet fitness model, which is like, you know, here's your, here's your membership. It's so cheap. You won't cancel, but we don't want you. And we know you're not going to show up. I, you know, Thanks for the so, donation. It's, I think, I don't know. Like you, we still, you're still relying on human behavior and like, and Oh, it would be a lot of work. Yeah, it just it wouldn't happen. It's you're it, you're you're the house in Vegas. Doesn't matter how good you learn about counting cards and if you you teach everybody the secrets, yeah, like human behavior will show that like people will will give in, will mess up, will be inconsistent, will not follow their rules, will and eventually the house always wins. Yeah. And I think that 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 model, the the gym model, is built on that. As as it's sad, but it's true. And and. The, the, and the way you can prove that is that literally if just the people, every big box gym right now, if just the people that they currently have, not getting any more, just currently have showed up to the gym, they they'd be, be shut able, down. Yeah, they, they The couldn't. fire marshal would come yes, in and say, exactly. you cannot operate your business. You were five times capacity because you have, you have five times the memberships that you have of people that could be allowed in this building. You do not have a building big enough to support the customers that you have. Yeah. The irony of that. It's crazy. I know, I know. You know, it's funny, Chaz, I think about it. It's like this uh, positive, it's this negative feedback loop. <clears throat> the gyms sign people up. People don't show up. We could charge less, get more members, and not be too busy. And it's like this cycle that just yeah. continues to feed itself. To the point now we have $9. <laughs> Dude, I know. See, and that's why I always liked sort of these uh, smaller yes, gyms. And yes. like the ones that, like all the attention was around the trainers that yes. were there. And like, I don't know, like if there was just like this explosion of those in comparison to the big box, humongous, mega Globo gym uh, sort of franchise out there, if there was just like a lot more pockets of these, uh, um, I guess, what do you call those like smaller I, type of? Uh, I, w I think I'll tell some, look, I'll say boutique, this, boutique I'll say this gyms. all day long. Okay. It, if you want, if you're going to get started in fitness and you want your best chances of success. Now I'm not saying you can't succeed in one of those mega gyms paying nine bucks a month. You totally can't. They've got equipment. It's good equipment. I've seen a lot of these gyms. They're great. Some of them are even clean for nine bucks a month. I don't know how they do that, but they've really figured it out. You'll have access. That'll work. However, uh, a big part of your success is going to be the kind of guidance you get, the environment that you're in, the community, you know, CrossFit proved that, right? The, the, the people you're around, your best odds are not I hate to say this in those, and I hate to say this because I'm sure one day these big box gyms are going to want to work with us and they're going to listen to this episode and be like, <laughs> never mind. But you can do it differently though. It's the smaller places. Like if you want your highest odds of success. Oh, are you talking about from the perspective of the client? Yes. Mm -hmm. Hiring. Go to a more yeah. expensive, smaller place yeah, with I think trainers. I think that's less to do with like the, the blaming the big box or, or, or saying that the boutique, it's just that the boutique is going to attract a trainer who is more qualified, more, yeah, experienced, more experienced, charges more money, gets paid more money, and therefore you just get a higher quality I'm, of service. I'm just saying yeah. even if you just paid to work out there. When I used to have my studio, I didn't do a lot of this, but every once in a while I would allow someone just to pay me a fee to work out there. And they were always super consistent. Why? Because it was tiny. They'd come in. Everybody would know them. We'd all know the person. And we'd oh, all start... see, I don't know if I agree with that. Oh. It... I thought it was interesting when we had Dr. Gabriel Lyon on and she was talking about all of our different personalities and stuff like that. Like, Well, you're a fitness fanatic. It's mm, totally different. Uh, These were right. everyday average people. They were not fitness fanatics. No, I mean, we'll take out the, the, the fitness fanatic part of me. I think she was describing more personality, like executive minds of people, the people that are like the performers that like- What percentage of the population is that? Oh, I don't know. Tiny. I mean, I don't know what the, per the percentage is, but I think you're also making an, an overgeneralization assuming that that people would be more successful in a boutique gym. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think there's a lot of people that knowing that people are watching them are more motivated for accountability reasons. It's the same reason why a lot of people post and share things. They, they know that if I put it out there or if a lot of people know I'm doing it, I feel committed now there's to doing it. There's a difference it. though between a lot of strangers and like the same faces. That's no. what I mean by the small gym. Uh, I don't know. Really? Yeah, I don't know if I agree with that. I don't. I don't think that. I don't think. I don't think there's too many people out there that go. 
you know what? Because I'm in this small little boutique gym, I, I think I I'm I was more consistent than if I would have been. I in the da- I I would bet money on that. I don't know, man. I would bet a lot of money on that. That mm. someone going in, look, CrossFit proved what? it. Mm. What do people go to CrossFit? These are warehouses. Yeah. They were shit gyms in comparison. They didn't have paint half of them, and people would go. I mean, CrossFit attracted everyday people who should not be doing CrossFit. Well, that, that's a class, right? So we're talking about two different things if you're talking about that. I'm talking about like a gym that Justin worked out where 15 to 20 trainers worked out of it. It's a small boutique gym. How consistent were the members in there compared to? Oh, yeah. Well, they had, well, they, yeah, they, they, they have to have an appointment to come. Oh, wait, you guys didn't have <laughs> yeah, yeah, either. Yeah, yeah. yeah they, so there was uh, no, yeah, members that were just there yeah. by themselves. Yeah, and then the classes are different, right? I mean, cl- the, the CrossFit and your Orange Theories and your F45s. Because I mean, you know what happens when you go to a small, you know, like 10,000 square foot gym is that you, you, you start to know everybody very quickly. You show up, mm-hmm. it's the same people. What's up, John? What's up, Susan? Hey, what's going on? And people like that. Um, I think that plays an important role uh, with fitness for a lot of people. Not, I'm not one of those people. I mean, I always felt that in a big box gym too, though. I mean, yeah. you, if you come in at six o'clock in the morning at 24 hour fitness down the street, you will see the same 6 30, a.m. Yeah. But not at. Well, at 5 p.m., you'll see a same. I mean, you'll see a bunch of other people too, but there's always a core group of consistent people. Yeah. Uh, you worked there. You saw them all. Yeah. I don't think yeah, so. Yeah. I don't know, dude. I, I mean, I, I my, my point is, I think there's the, a million ways to skin a cat. Yeah. yeah I think but, you yeah. can have success, but I think if you want your best odds of success, work with a trainer. Obviously, a good trainer is going to get you there. The odds are far higher than doing it on your own. And then if you're not going to work with a trainer, yeah. going to a place where the people there know you and care about you, and you can do that in a big box. We did that in a big box. Mm-hmm. But a lot of big boxes don't have that that environment. They just don't. The smaller ones tend to, you know? Yeah, that's I a, mean, that's a cultural thing that's happening yeah. to the gyms for yeah. sure. That's but one thing's there. for, you know, back to the strength training, uh, the gyms, even the big boxes are changing their footprints. They're, they're d- dedicating way more space now to strength training. I love that, that shift, you yeah. know, of, of focus. And and I think that that's, that's going to help a lot in terms of people, you know, the, the culture, uh, moving more towards like strength training and too. And I think, you know, I, I think that, um, the emphasis on having coaches and trainers in these big gyms yeah. was, was definitely a decline. And, and I think if they bring that, that energy back where it's like, you know, we're, we incentivize the coaches, we're paying them well and everything else to actually help the members. Like, I think it, you can, you can accomplish what you accomplish in the smaller gym setting in a bigger box, as long as the access and availability is there. It's all about culture. Hey, who, uh, who this pulled is this Ursha. up? Is this you? Who pulled this up? Andrew? Yeah, and I have this here. So this save, is- save that. That's good information for all of our trainer stuff that we're doing right now. This is great. This is from Ursa, huh? Yeah. You see all this stuff? So it says that since 2010, that the amount of people that go to gyms has gone up 27%. Six, is that 63 or 6.3? No, despite 6.3% of Americans never using their gym membership, the number of people visiting gyms at least two times a week is an impressive 50%. Huh. Is that... How do they get in that stuff? I've seen other st- statistics. Yeah. Um, for example, I got another one that says 38% attend multiple times a week. How do they figure that I out? Mean, I mean, Ursa would probably be one of the best places to Ursa's get this. Ursa's a little bit biased. It's also 2019. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's not the point. <laughs> Ursa's a little biased, by the way. That's the International Health the Racket and Sports Club Association. I know, but I feel like they I've never seen it. them put out anything that says that the oh negative doing towards. That. Uh, <laughs> I get what you're saying. It's like yeah. that like conversation we have about real estate agents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great time to buy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> always a great time to buy. It's always a good time. <laughs> so anyway, I There's, mean that, that's a, that's a lot though. That's a, that's an, that's impressive. Today's program giveaway maps anabolic advanced. If you want to win that, do this: leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. That enters you to win. We also put together four workout program bundles this month and then discounted them massively, right? $300 to $350 off the normal price. Here's the four workout program bundles. We have the new to weightlifting bundle, the body transformation bundle, the new year extreme intensity bundle, and the body transformation bundle 2.0. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Hey, talking about fitness, I just read this hilarious study that you guys would appreciate, especially you, you, Justin, because right. you, you did you coached uh, you know young athletes and stuff. Uh-huh. So there's two okay after like being exhausted, you have your kids run or whatever. 
there's two general postures you see where people try to catch their breath. Yeah, yeah. Arms over the head or hunched over, or and on they the are, knees. and they already, they already yeah, proved, hunched over the knees. Is they proved that they proved the hands over your head was a false, a false was false. We talked ha- about this. Yeah, hands on. You did. Yeah, it's yeah. superior we heart rate to, recovery and greater. We greater used to tidal think volume. the theory yes. used to be that <laughs> your coach used to tell you Make to don't don't <laughs> bend over to put your hands over your head to open up your lungs so you could breathe better, and that that was proven. That was false. propaganda, dude. Yeah, it, it was proven. It, and really, they were trying to promote that because they don't want to show weakness, you know, and you want to like present yourself as like, yeah, like, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm not I'm fatigued because yeah. like if you're if the opposing team what looks over and you're silent, everybody's over just dog tired and like yeah. trying to catch their breath. What kind of signal is that sending out? Like, oh. you know, so I think it's I think it's derived from that. You know, I 100 percent agree. That's why I don't think it'll change. Yeah. I think if you were to go watch a football field or a basketball court, I think a coach well, would still I will tell you right things. away, and I knew this because we, okay, so when I was trying out for uh, San Jose State, um, it was the most brutal, like for walk-ons, like they put you through the ringer. And I had to, I had to pass this one test that was uh, like, you do liners. And so you do, um, it was 10 yards, 20 yards, 30 yards, four, all the way to like 100 and back. And it was timed and like you had to make it under a certain amount of minutes. Uh, otherwise you had to come back at 6 a.m. to do it again. And I'm just like, dude, fuck this. I haven't put everything on the line with this. Like, I do not want to do this again. Ran as hard and fast as I possibly could. I felt like my, my heart exploded by the end I was done. And the coaches were there and they're like, everybody stand up, put your own like, and I was like, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> just on the ground, yeah. getting all the air I could. And it, that was the only way I could get air. And then they made me stand up. And I'm, and I, I seriously was like almost hyperventilating. I couldn't get my breath. Yeah. And I knew like being down in that hunched position. So I'm like, this is all bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Completely. Wow. Yeah. yeah that, that that psychological piece <clears throat> is important. I, yeah, for sure. If you you gotta think like imagine uh No, that makes so, so much sense. Yeah, you look across the, the field or across the court and your opponents I, are all hunched bro, over. I did You're this, like, oh, we got them. They're I on did their this heels. as an adult yeah. in a, a jujitsu tournament. The I only competed a few times, but the one I won, I went against this dude and he was like he was not in my weight class, but whatever. That's another story. And we it was brutal. We were going at each other and when we would have to stop because we go out of bounds. I would run back to my starting spot and, and I was fatigued, but I wanted him to think like, Oh, this guy's not getting tired, but I was dying because I have that psychology. I mean, yeah, there's mm-hmm. such a psychological warfare going, especially s- sports where you're going heads up against something like that. Right. Yeah. Cause you get scared. Yeah, or you, you feel don't like show any weakness. You, you, then you're done. Yeah. You know, I wanted to, you remember when we brought up you guys a little, a little change of direction here, but I want to bring it up because I just saw it and I want to, I'll have Doug and them confirm it, but I thought it was interesting. So you remember when we brought up the Southwest, uh, their, their policy, of, well, they'll, they'll give a free seat to somebody who's too big to sit. Yeah. In now when we had that conversation, we were kind of speculating like, Oh, what's, you know, what's this going to be? One of the theories that I had is like, this is just a publicity stunt. It's going to, piss off a certain part of people. Other people are going to be supportive of it. It's going to create, and it's all just a big way to spread yeah. their information. Yeah. That was kind of my theory on it. Now I couldn't prove that, but I just saw something recently that said that that has been a, a, a rule of for a long time, for 30 years for yeah, the Southwest. That. Yeah, I knew that. So a hundred percent, that was a publicity yeah. stunt. Yeah, no, it was a rule, but then they started to put it out more. You're right. Maybe like, no, we're going to start to do this. So I don't know yeah. why so they're they promoting charging for two seats. Before? So that was so that it, you could do what they what you've heard recently. You could have done that twenty years ago, but they did it very quietly. So uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, of course. And so the the theory the the theory is that they're doing it to put pressure on all the other airlines. Uh, but at the end of the day, it was all a publicity stunt. Mm. It's, if it's a rule that they've had for thirty years, either that or and now at, it's making its way in articles all over the place. It was brilliant. Either that or looking at demographics, like if we get all the. Big people over here. You know what I mean? We're going to crush. No, I think it was purely a, I mean, because no matter what, it's a, it's a losing strategy for, it's, it's a losing strategy for any airline business model. Yeah. It's not a smart business yeah. strategy, no matter how you draw yeah, it up. That's true. So the only thing that makes it smart is if it's a massive publicity run. And that's mm-hmm. exactly what it was. I mean, they've been doing it for 30 years. I wonder though, well, did they, free marketing. I got to think about this for a second. Did they put it out or did somebody drum it up and make a clickbaity article and then it circulate? It, it, yeah. Was there an incident? What you got, Andrew? Yeah, so basically a viral TikToker um, was a plus size style content creator, self-identified fat solo traveler. Her name is Kimberly Garris. She's the one who detailed the policy and basically brought attention to it. See, it wasn't in Southwest. It was someone else trying to drum it up. 
Inter- you think she works for Southwest? You think she got paid? <laughs> I mean, if I'm Southwest, I have that, and I'm a marketing guy, and I go, "Hey, here's our, here's what we want to do." It's even. It's like, do you remember when the iPhone? Remember the 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 old i the I think I, Apple was one of the first people to do this. That was so brilliant when they supposedly somebody who was working with Apple left their new generation at the at bar. bar. Yeah, I oh, too that much is, yeah. vividly. Yeah, it's like. That Apple's behind that, but you you use somebody else as the decoy of like they fucked up. There they, was a movie they let did, people get. The, there was get, a movie that did that with that. Uh, that it's a picture of that girl with that really weird smile and stare, and they had her go to to professional sports. Yes, sport yeah, that, that was for that was for the scary movie, the smile, yeah. Uh-huh. smile. Yeah, they they paid up they paid a bunch of people to stand and just smile, stare really weird, straight like ahead. Baseball games, uh-huh. yeah, like oh yeah, I, oh, yeah. I like it's stuff great. like that. I so think do I. Just, I think it's smart. I do. I think that's such. Creative. Wasn't there another one where there was like uh-huh. these weird silver monoliths yes. that were just appearing everywhere? Yeah, we talked like, about where that. are these from? I think yeah, I think that one was actually like a. I think it was a comedy show uh, on Comedy Central. It was like these guys from Australia. Mm-hmm. I, I'm pretty sure that they were the ones responsible for that. But yeah, it was a total publicity yeah. stunt. Speaking of comedy. What did you guys think of Chappelle? Did we talk about this yet? It was I good. I haven't seen it. I'm, I'm with Doug. I don't think it was his best. You know what? Chappelle, I think he, this is why I think he's the GOAT. Not because, although some of his specials are some of the funniest I've ever seen. He's so smart. He takes you on such a ride. Yeah. yeah. And it's hard to, I like it when I can't really guess uh, what, what side he's on. Yeah. What what yeah, yeah. what their opinions are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they so eloquently, he does that very well. He'll paint, he'll create a story. So that, I think that's why I think this was like a subpar one of his. I, I only felt like he did that once, maybe twice in the thing where mm. I feel like some of his shows, it feels like you're on a ride the whole yeah. time. He's pulling you left. He's pulling you right. You think he thinks this way. Then he hits you with it. It's like the whole thing is that where I felt like he came out the gates with the the transgender joke right out the gates, and he so he opened with fire. Like I thought, oh, that was hilarious. you had no idea he was going there. Yeah, right I had there. no idea he was going there. So he took you on a ride, rather, and you're like, oh yeah. But then I, to be honest, I felt like the rest of it would kind of was flat mm-hmm. compared to that. Like that was like, oh, I like we Katrina and I started. And I was like, oh, this is gonna be so good. This is like yeah. off the chain, and we just started in the first three minutes. And I was like, oh, he he opened with his fire. Like that was his best like ride that he took you on. I felt like everything was, it's yeah. always, I mean, he's fire. You know who I'm getting, who I'm really liking is what's his name? Shane Gillis. Is that his name? Yeah. Shane Gillis. Dude, dude. He's hilarious. He is. Kills me. Yeah. I watch some of his older stuff. Kills yeah. me. I like Matt Reif right now. I'm on his stuff right now. A lot. Is he the guy that plays the audience? The yeah. Crowd? He works the crowd so good. Yeah. He works. He's that crowd. young kid. He's What's also the guy who got, he got, he got, uh, Called out for some like sexist. Remember he, he made oh, the, I know, he yes. made the joke about a girl having a black eye and something mm-hmm. like that. So he made like a, 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 a you know domestic violence like joke. Yeah. And yeah. so they came after him. And then he did a, a fake. Or he did an apology mm-hmm. and then linked it to like special special helmets you know, for people. Like for, oh, <laughs> oh, yeah, it was yeah. so bad. Dude. Right. So he like doubled down <laughs> on it. So so I like him. So I'm all about I it. I feel I'm like yeah, him. some of these comedians coming up are definitely more emboldened now. Uh, in terms totally. of like yeah, kind of pushing back against some of the cultural things. You know what? On. People don't realize how important uh, comedians are. Super important. To culture. They start it and then it allows everybody else to get a little more comfortable with it. That's what's so yeah. great about it. It's like they're the ones that can get away with with really pushing saying anything, ed- saying anything and pushing the edge because they're they're under the, the umbrella of comedy. Co- comedy. So societies need that. And what's great about that is it, it, it slowly eases people into like, okay, this isn't that, this isn't as bad as, well, as crazy yes, as it has to point out. out the absurdities and, and the inconsistencies and, and, you know, like sort of like in a shocking way for you to be able to accept it. A lot of people don't want to hear it from certain voices and certain uh, outlets, you know? And so if you hear it in a way that's somewhat cheeky and, and yeah. funny and, you know, a, a lot it, it's received better, and so it's it it really is. It's 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 a masterful craft when you can when you can get somebody that normally wouldn't listen to certain ideas to to well, what's, uh, what's absorb the, them. What's the saying? Like we know when the king has gone mad when he kills his jester, because mm-hmm. it's such an important. Like the jester was the one person that could make fun of the king. Yeah, it was very important that that person existed. Well, because the propaganda arms right now are so strong, oh, we're just getting bro. inundated from everything else that wants to just entrench you in like just one way of thinking. Oh, well, it's, it's speaking brutal. of that, did you see? So, um, what's his Chip Wilson? Is it Chip Wilson? Is the uh, or Chip? Yeah, Chip Wilson. I think is the the founder of Lululemon. He got some pushback lately for for publicly talking about their you know Lululemon's recent move into like more diversity inclusiveness for the brand and stuff like that, mm. like really talking shit about. It. Now he's no longer the founder; like he sold 
uh, a big part of his shares. What know. was un- what was not inclusive about the stuff before? Was it just the sizes? Yeah, the uh, sizes, their marketing, everything. It was literally like he had decided, like we are going after you know thin, fit, healthy, you know, sure. eight, you know, eighteen year old to thirty two year old Got women it. is like Got that's well, that's our demographic, and we're all in on that. And obviously, it's grown to be a billion dollar company over the last decade or whatever. And he's he exited, I think, at two thirteen fifteen. He still has. I think, I don't know if he has majority shares. I know he has a lot of shares. And so he has some say, but not much. And so the companies came out and like said, we don't stand by anything he says, but he's been taking shots at them for- He's saying that they should be more? They shouldn't less. be. They're, oh. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? Like, this is like, your commercials aren't representing the healthy, fit people. That's our market. That's who we oh. went after, right? So let's see what it says. Hmm. Oh, yeah. wow. He, he, he called out the company ads for featuring people who he said appeared unhealthy, sickly, and not inspirational. Yeah. They're, They're trying more. to become like wow. the gap, everything to everybody. And I think the definition of a brand is that you're not everything to everybody. You've got to be clear that you don't want certain customers coming in. I mean, yeah. he's not wrong. Yeah. That is that is kind of what a brand is supposed to, I mean, because well, if a brand doesn't do that. That's why I have competition too, to serve other yeah. swaths of the population yeah. and other demographics. Yeah. It's like, Otherwise it gets why does a down. company have to be everything? Yeah, it, You know, why can't they just. Whatever happened to people doing this? I don't like that company. I'm not going to buy from them. Exactly. Yeah. And also like, you know, okay, like there's a need for this uh, group of people. Let's, let's provide them. That's why I always services. think it's funny when somebody, I mean, I guess this, this is the entrepreneurial brain, right? Like yeah. when somebody gets mad about that, I'm like, dude, that's so dumb to get mad about it. That should be, if it's you opportunity. really opportunity, go yeah. create one. Yeah. I'm so glad Lulu's not going to dominate that space too. Now I can go offer it to people that are plus 24. But size. that same like, person is going to complain about monopolies. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's like, it's so inconsistent. That's uh yeah, that's interesting to me. Uh, everything's, everything's you're right. Been, the same person would complain about monopolies too. It's same. How funny is oh, that? But so, you have to do it for everybody. Yeah, <laughs> they're selling too many. You have to try and sell to everybody, but you can't have everybody. Oh, but you man, have to try no, to sell to everybody. But as soon as you get to everybody, then we're going to cut you off. Confusing. Speaking of speaking of which, you saw you sh- you sent me that video of that dude trying to break down Patrick Bet David. Oh show. yeah yeah yeah. How is oh, insurance? I'm glad you brought that up because I, I how his insurance a- company that had before was a scam. And the evidence that he, that he used was how what how small of a percentage the people that made like eight hundred thousand dollars a year was versus well, the people. So this that made is a very po- so I'll have the, I'll make sure Andrew you get the clip for me because he in this video he actually clips the the breakdown like so someone got a hold of so if you don't well, know he had to just he he he, he sold it or something he no had no no to. he still has that company oh oh yeah he a big part of how Patrick Pat David makes his money is through insurance sales right okay that's a majority of his I mean he's made value tainment and his podcast and the else it. he's made million but he made hundreds of millions off of his insurance business right so he's gl- grown his I and maybe Doug can look up how many employees he has um, or how many people are quote unquote underneath him in his insurance business. But they, so this guy, and it was Coffeezilla did it first. Who well, I'm not, I'm like, this guy sometimes does good stuff, but sometimes he annoys me. Uh, did a, a breakdown on him and basically showed, you know, uh, you know, what percentage of people make, you know, what, how much money, right? Okay, so the point is, is that the majority of people lose money with, or uh, excuse me, make almost no money with the company. He, he tried to show that it was a scam. That, that Patrick it was a pyramid made, scheme. That that, like, this scheme. is a pyramid. Uh, here's a, this is a, a definition of a pyramid scheme when, you know, 99% of the people make no money and only 1% of the people make most of the money. And it's like all these people are starving or making less money than a McDonald's employee. It's a terrible. It paints a really nasty picture of how the business model is. Now, I send it over to you because I've we've talked before about, okay, if we were ever to scale beyond what we're currently doing and we were to open this up to coaches and trainers and we were to do some sort of an affiliate program, that's exactly what our model would look like. And it would be inevitable. If you, if we allowed trainers- Yeah, because they're not trainers, employees, they're contractors. Yeah, right. If we allowed trainers and coaches to sell our programs and they made a, a percentage of that and then we get a percentage of that ourselves and we did some sort of a tier yeah, less where, than one percent would do 90 percent. that's of right most yeah. th- there would be a, a very very small percentage of outliers that actually make a lot of money doing that and then the most people would try and do it and would make a little bit of money here and there yeah. and so you could totally yeah. str- look make it make it look like oh these guys are running a pyramid scheme. No, that's just how a lot of that's how a lot of these you know insurance business in general is like that. I, I, it's it's crazy how he was trying to use that to paint 
I, w- I was thinking I was going to show like crazy evidence. That was his evidence. You know, 0.1% makes this much. And I mean, like, it, well, works, I guess that. it works for yeah. people though, because people see that and it looks How so- much money people mm. make does not tell you whether or not, or don't make, does not tell you whether or not they're bad or good. We it doesn't that. say that. Yeah. So it is an MLM and uh, they have 20,000 licensed agents. So I don't know a lot about this company, yeah. but if you're doing an MLM, you're probably offering an opportunity. So sign up with our company. You have to become licensed. You can sell our products and then you can make a commission. So it is an MLM, bro. Yeah. So, but MLM is not, is a, a legal, yeah. very heavily scrutinized. Well, let me make a point here. That's not a Let me make scheme. a point here Different. with that. So you get 20,000 people who go out and get an insurance license. Yeah. A, most of those people are not even going to try to sell. They Correct. get they get sucked up into the excitement about how much they could make, Correct. but they don't actually go out and do anything. A bunch of people are going to go out and do it. And I've been in the life insurance business myself for like 20 years. I actually, when I was like 27 years old, I went and I got a license for life insurance because somebody told me that it was a great way to make money. I went out, I talked to people, I got these leads. I mean, I, I tried to sell life insurance. I couldn't do it back then. And so I didn't make any money, but I made a choice that I was going to try to build my own business. So, so I went and got licensed and I tried to sell life insurance, but I didn't make any money. So yeah. I, I failed at the business. Uh, since then, I went and had created a, a life insurance agency and I had success. But I, I tell you, if you work for a life insurance company, in fact, regular life insurance companies like New York Life or any big life insurance company, they're going to have... I don't know about New York life, but a lot of insurance companies have independent agents. Yeah. So you can come, you can be an independent agent. You have to get licensed. That's on your own dime. You can sell for the company, but you only make when you actually bring in business. Yeah, it's all up to you. And the vast majority of people for all these massive insurance companies don't make anything. Mm -hmm. And so his thing's no different than any other insurance company, uh, except- He's in the public eye. Yeah, yeah. Like, so is a pyramid scheme the same thing as a bro, Ponzi scheme? Bro, is that the a, same a pyramid name? scheme? Well, is, no, no, no. Ponzi scheme is different. Though. A yeah. pyramid scheme is the same thing as an MLM. Oh, okay, okay. Well, yes. no, 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 no. That's no. not true. A pyramid scheme is more like a Ponzi scheme. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, MLM is actually a legitimate business structure. Yep. Uh, it's, so, <laughs> so, so think about a pyramid scheme Semantics or a Ponzi. We're arguing over uh, right now. No, no, no. Pyramid it's very scheme, different. Uh, Ponzi scheme. The people at the top get paid because people from the bottom are bringing in money. And you have to keep bringing people in. And the, typically, yeah. there's no real value of a product being uh, offered. Okay. Yeah, right. See, look, here that's, you go. Yeah. So the reason traditional MLM programs are legal because there's a real product that's being sold through the channel. Fraudulent pyramid schemes like Ponzi schemes are legal, but often try to disguise Nothing. themselves. Yeah, and right. they're not really selling anything. No, it's so all just to get people just in. Money. It's like, yeah, so a classic one would be yeah. like, hey, Adam and Justin, give me your money. I'm going to guarantee you a 20% return. And you're like, done. The way I give you a 20% I return mean, it's, is I it's sign a very, you're, you're, yeah. But just so you know, it's a very fine line you're skirting here. They're not that far off. The difference with the MLM is you're actually offering a product and a service. That's a big difference. I think a massive difference. I mean, it's, it is. I mean, think about like uh, I wouldn't, look, Bernie Bert, Madoff, yes. right? Yeah. So he, he he had these fake securities that's a Ponzi and things. Scheme. That's, a, Ponzi, yeah, that's, a, that's to- a pyramid scheme yeah, yeah, as well. That's, yeah, that's a total Ponzi scheme. That, that You're totally, you are blatantly robbing from people. This is structured in a way where you could make money and you're, there is a product. Of course. But it's still a, it's still a. Oh, it's a terror. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go into it. I mean, some yeah. people make a lot of money. I've, I've met guy, uh, a yeah. guy who made like two hundred thousand dollars a month from like New Skin. Uh, new Skin. Yeah, New Skin. Wow. I knew somebody who made a lot of money with Amway. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so you can do it. You could buy t- toothpaste. Yeah. It? But these businesses typically thrive on bringing in recruits. That's yeah. exactly right. Yes. And that's the that's the part that's so distasteful about it. Is that yeah, I agree. Um, like I agree. like the the model is structured where it's like I really don't give a fuck that Justin doesn't sell any of my, my long programs. As long as he, up for as long as he gets ten other trainers it's bought in the because they gotta pay five hundred dollars yeah. to get in through our certification to get all these things. And so as long as he goes and recruits ten of those people who think they're gonna go sell one program. Or, or you know, like Listen, I don't, this is it, why I've always had a, all of us. A lot closer. This, to this like is why cults. all of us have had a bad taste with the, the you know coaching programs. The, the, you know, we're going to make trainers this and that and whatever. And they, you <sighs> know, you you go into these rooms. You see, That's how these masterminds are built. Exactly. By the way, which That's is like an MLM. Said, yes. It's not a Ponzi scheme. No. It's legit. They get a service. They get something like that. But they're very much so structured in an MLM type of structure. I fucking hate that. I know. Yeah. Did I tell I you? And by the way, I'm a big fan of Patrick Brett David. I love the content he puts out. I love this book. Yeah. I like. I have a lot of nice things to say on him. 
I'm not a fan of that. I'm yeah. not a fan I agree of with the you. MLM. There's a there's a lot of ways to make a lot of money and you, mm-hmm. and you it just can, doesn't feel right. So so I told you when Doug and I we went to an internet marketing kind of like this, I don't know what you would call it, but it's it was similar to that. And we signed up for a mastermind. We paid a lot of money for that mastermind. And I remember when we sat with this small group of people that paid a lot of money, I remember I looked around and I said, Oh my God, everybody sucks. There's like two of us here who probably yeah. are gonna do something, and right. everybody else is just paying the money. To want I mean, to be a part yeah. of this group, but in defense of the that. mastermind, they didn't know who was going to sign up. They didn't know if they're going to be successful or yeah, not, and yeah. we got value. So yeah, we, we paid for value through the mastermind. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But a lot of them Don't are a them lot of them are structured in a in a way where it's like I get the thousands of dollars from you to come to attend my mastermind, and then let me teach you how to make your own masterminds. Mm-hmm. Yes. Let me teach you how to do the same thing that I just did to you. And it's just this vicious cycle mm-hmm. of, and, and they all justify it because when you get these groups of 10, 50, a hundred people that are paying for these mastermind groups is there's always one other hungry entrepreneur who's willing to invest in themselves, i.e. the two of you knuckleheads yeah. who meet another one who is the same way too. And it's like, you go, and you justify, you go, I made connections. Well, I made a connection with Doug. Yeah. Let's Doug's just look good- at the structure of the twin flames. Cult. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And it, you will see like a direct parallel to what well, you well, that is talking a, that's about. That's an MLM right there. Yeah, yes. But that's, but that's another level. That's a cult. When you, when, when that's well, what these, they're, hey, get, they're getting bro, fervorous that's what these, people yes. to-, to if, you like, if you watch these it's videos- the same, on these, Okay, come on. It's no, really that's, the same This thing. is why I couldn't do it because- Here's the line. I'll tell you what the line is. If you go to an MLM and they have a real product, this yeah. is how you know you're in a cult. When the leader starts to have sex with everybody, <laughs> See, yeah, that's, right, right, every okay. time Stupid. that's part that's, of it. Hey, find but, one. But also but the, the the twin flames, it was legit, just MLM style. But then he he realized he has a tax advantage if they turn themselves into a religious uh, entity. Oh, yeah, that's right. And so, and they deliberately said that, Let, you know. And listen, then people, <laughs> I've I've shared this multiple times with you guys. So this and, is where and, my conundrum and other people that have talked about the business and that have tried to get us to move in this direction. And none of us would ever want to do this. And there's literally somewhere between six and nine million dollars a year on the table for us to hold these types of events. But when you know the statistics on the success of the entrepreneur, and when you sell this dream to be like, I, I just the part that I couldn't handle would be the and how they all do these, okay, including PBD and all these other MLMs, is you host these massive events where 100, 200 people get there and you're hyping them all up about what they need to do and what this and and the reality is if you got a hundred people in that room. Less than ten of those fuckers are ever going to make the money you're talking about. And, and would they and, have and done? Le- and would they have done it without? Anyways, that? yeah. And they and those yeah. and 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 all it really does is pull the, the ten that would have actually done it. It just all you did was you got those ten people who would have found a way anyways, you know and of- then you highlight those people yeah. as they had success for coming through your group. When the reality is, even if they never met you, they would have yeah. figured that. Success you know how for the was. recruitment, how much respect I would have. For a, 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 an event like that, if I sat in a crowd and the guy got up there and said, "All right, here's the truth. There's a thousand of you. Yeah. You're gonna make it. Three of you are gonna and make you're it. Gonna make Everybody it. else is not gonna make it." <laughs> I would do that. Yeah. If I, I ever did, too. if yeah. I did something like that, I would 100 percent come out the gates with like. And you still get buy in because people are like, "That's me, though. Yeah, I'm the yeah. third. I'm, I'm the, the guy that's three. gonna make it." <laughs> yeah. I mean, to me, that's the way. The only way <laughs> you could have integrity and in doing something like that is literally coming you out. Gotta with be honest. It. I would. I would come out with it and just be like, "Here's the deal. Like, there is a hundred of you. Ninety nine percent of you. Sir. Yeah. There's three of you that are actually gonna take what I have to, te- to teach today and are actually gonna excel with it. And I hope. Yeah. I hope I get to sit down and meet each one of you. But the rest of you are gonna fuck off. That's what's yeah. going to happen. And yeah. you're not, you're going to have burnt this $10,000. Right. Yeah. Like there's everybody thinks they're the three. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> I feel bad for all these assholes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's so funny. That's me in the that's audience. So, dude, I got to tell you. Uh, so we're going to take a, a turn here, but uh, did you see that this kid, how old is he? 13 years old, just broke the world record on Tetris. What? Yeah, so and did you Tetris. know Tetris? I love Tetris, dude. Okay, so do you know that that, that Tetris it speeds up? That gets hard, man. It speed not only does it speed up, but there really isn't a last level. Do you guys know this? I just, it just learned this. It keeps going indefinitely. It keeps going until the it's a 13-year-old. 13-year-old broke the world record. It keeps going until the algorithm, so it goes faster, 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 until the algorithm gets overwhelmed, and then you get what's called, I think, a death screen where the screen freezes. Wow. And this kid did it. It's he got a, to the death screen? They call it a, a kill screen. 
And it was like level 157 or something like that. What? Yeah. <laughs> How fast that is. I've gotten like, I don't even know what level I've gotten. How do you do that? And then even the music speeds up. It uh, must have been like. Beep, 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 beep. How do you do that? So he did a hundred uh, level 155. I think he did it, and it took him. I don't know how long it took him. I mean, how wild! That's wild. You know, talk about the genetic gift of your brain to do that kind of math that fast because you're. Yeah. It's it's it, that's all it is, right? It's, it's math geometry. Yeah. So yeah what's geez. his job going to be? I mean, hopefully he, he finds a hopefully way to put it, it to work. I don't know, architecture, Dr drone or? operator. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that uh, sucks. Yeah, I don't know what what kind of math. What, I mean, what kind of uh, skill, kaleidoscope or maker? job would yeah. require that kind of skill? <laughs> what? What'd you say, kaleidoscope maker? I don't understand. Ooh, uh, the, uh, all the shapes, bro. Oh, I see. <laughs> Come on, guys. That's just too many levels Stay ahead. with me. <laughs> his is, his is, jokes are is, way so yeah, far ahead too sometimes. Too far ahead. Like, you guys stand up. It's all right. I Fine. Uh, I, I give up. That's crazy. All right. Hey, so Justin, I want to ask you about this. Did we talk about the billionaire bunkers that are being built? Did I bring? Did we bring those we up? We brought here? up Zuck. Zuck's bunk. Aren't there more? There's a hundred and something. Wait, like where? Where are these located? You guys didn't know that? There's like a look up how many billionaires in the last like three years have built bunkers. It's like a lot. Is it's it not, like the middle of the country or like is it well, all Zuck islands? Is, Zuck was like Hawaii. Well, he's in Hawaii. It? Yeah, he's in like Hawaii. It's a weird they, place to, to, to build your bunker. Right. Well, no. Um, it's, I think it's a safe place if there's a- Really? <laughs> a pot, Unless a not, meteor an hits. Yeah. I, I would think in the, the middle oh. of Montana oh. or like Oklahoma or something. Did you bring weird. up the meteor? Nobody's, no, country, no. no country who's looking to take us over or bomb us is going to go like, Hmm. hmm, Oklahoma. Yeah. <laughs> you know well, like, I don't think they're worried about. Where there's that. two people out in the middle of nowhere. Let's. I don't know. He yeah. might know something we don't know. But there's a, so there's a lot of bunkers being built. Yes. Look at look, how many. I thought I thought I heard like 120 or 130. Something. Well, here's another the thing. The bunker that, business is booming. Well, here's another thing that'll scare you. So you know, in election season, we're in election season right now. Election year. What are the, in October, there's always what's called the October surprise. This is when they each side will drop their drop heaviest their hammer. Yeah. To try to to mess with the other side because there's not enough time. Right. Last one was supposed to be Hunter Biden's laptop, which didn't pan out. Yeah. We, we, yeah. They yeah. blocked that. But anyway, there's always this like October surprise. What, the NASA just came out. October 5th, we're going to get, re there's an asteroid that we lost track of that's going to be really Stop close. It. I swear to God, Fucking dude. Fucking Armageddon for yeah, freaking bro. October surprise. Yeah. Jesus. Oh, yeah. meteor. Yeah. What you got, Doug? You got well, they say 15 uh, billionaires have started building bunkers, but apparently that's not true according to some fact checker. Who? But, Is it Tommy uh, Snopes? Snopes. Snopes? Not Snopes, Snopes, but you know, I never believe these it fact might checkers. Been, it might have been just million. How many, how many uh, bunkers are being... Uh, or how many of these guys are building these bunkers? I don't know if it was billionaires. Could you imagine though? You ever think about? You ever thought? You had like a full thought process of this? Like if you had a bunker, mm -hmm. let's say you had an amazing one, right? And you set it up like it could filter air. There's nuclear fallout. You're fine. You're underground. Nothing touches you. You've got enough food and water, and you could you got sewage system and everything that'll last you six months. Okay. Okay. So now you you survive for six months. Yeah. And you get out of the bunker. Really? Now what? Now what? Like, would you want that? Think about that. All right, kids. Now that we've been going crazy for six months and whatever, who knows what that's going to be like. Well, now maybe, let's go out the top. I and guess you're hoping that like um, it wasn't as uh, much of a catastrophe. Like, maybe it was just the fact that like, uh, you know, society lost its mind. Everybody was like sort of going back and reverting back to like uh, um, where there was looting and there was like – you know, like pandemonium. Yeah. Well, we right? talked about it was this. like chaos, and then and then you're able to weather that and come back out. That's well, we talked about this off air, right? Well, you your hope is that it's just yeah. like a nuclear bomb, right? That went off, and then in thirty to sixty days or whatever like that, it clears the out. Fl and then, yeah. Fallout clears yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what you got to hope, right? Yeah. <laughs> is that it's something like that, not something crazy. I don't know, man. I'd be like, would I want to be that guy in there? First of all, you're locked in there for six months, three months, even thirty days. Could I mean, you'd you rather be that than the guy who days? caught the bomb, you know. Huh? You'd rather be that guy than the guy who caught the bomb. I mean, I feel like it'd be torturous. Like, imagine living in this room for 30 days. Just us right here. Oh, uh, no. 30 days. I'm not even saying six months. No. A full month. <laughs> just us. In oh, here. murder you guys. Yeah. You well, know? you guys would rather die. Yeah. 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 Little, <laughs> I, I love you guys. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I love you guys. But after five days, it'd be fucking, it would be good. It's you too confined. You know, yeah, I don't I, know I, about I get, that. Because you, you know, fever. it's funny you say that because from our our position of, of where we're at now, but. If it was life or death, you probably have a whole new perspective. You'd be so grateful that we bonded together, we survived. I bet you you would have a whole different. <laughs> We're all married. 
<laughs> Stupid. <laughs> no, but I mean, hey, about, three three days in, right? And then they let I mean, us out day four. You, you're, so what'd you guys do for three days? Um, I, was, I don't want to talk about it, really. <laughs> yeah, we got. I mean, your, your your perspective is coming from a place of privilege right now, where you have all these Sal, all these amenities, all this luxury, all this nice stuff. But it's like if the whole world is under fire. And you happen to be with three or four of your friends who happen to be smart enough to build a bunker and we survived and we're a very small percentage of people that survived. I bet you would have a different. What would you need in your bunker to not lose your mind? Um, a gym. Yeah, for sure. I would, uh, for sure a gym. That would be the only So thing I don't even think that. Okay, think about this again. Is this The whole world is getting burned up in flames right now. What we're probably spending 99% of our time is like how, when we get out, how are we re rebuilding our families, our society? What's the first thing we do? Do you know how to build this? Can I build? Like, where are we going to get? I mean, I, planning. That's what I think. I think yeah, thirty twenty four seven. You go crazy. You I think I would. Not yeah, really. I would need it all gives you the purpose. books you purpose. of like yeah. skills of like. Okay, yeah. uh, at that point, I'm, I'm I know how to crochet things. You know, like whatever. <laughs> Hopefully, like, we have I access to YouTube. busy, dude. Yeah. Because... Hopefully, we have access to YouTube still. <laughs> Justin would. <laughs> Justin would be the one. I'm needing everybody's sweaters, <laughs> yeah. dude. You know, like I just I learned got, this, you guys. I got some data on bunkers. Oh okay, yeah, what you got? So this guy. Gary Lynch is the CEO of a company in Texas called Rising S Company, and they started in a warehouse in 2018 where they built bunkers. And he said after tw the year 2020, the sales have spiked a thousand percent. Wow! And he went in mid 2022, fielding less than 100 inquiries a day. No, in a month to fielding thousands. Wow! Uh, in a month, he sold five bunkers in a single day in February. Wow. Oh, the price ranges aren't bad: 70 to 240 grand. Hmm. Yeah, that's, not, that's not bad. No, wasn't there this service that was like a it was like a a religious apocalyptic service, and they said, uh, "What?" They, they said something like, "You give us this money, and then when the world ends, we'll come and help you." <laughs> like, and you write a contract, like literally. Now that's a when Ponzi the world ends. That's, wow. a that's, a that's a Ponzi scheme. A that's a Ponzi racket. scheme right there, Sal. <laughs> wow. Because <laughs> if the world ends, you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The contract's not we will be there. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Go find Maybe. a lawyer. Yeah. Take me to court. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. insane. Oh, anyway, shit. I got to tell you guys. Uh, of all the partners that we work with, um, the one company that my family uses the most to the point where. I don't know if I should say this on air. LMNT sends us a lot of uh, a lot of product. Yeah, a lot of that goes to my family. I my I, as soon as I give people a box of that, they are like, "Give me more." Well, share the story about your sister. You were so my me sister. Off my sister was doing Whole Thirty, which is basically a whole food diet, right? She cut out a lot of processes. Yeah, all also. of us are big fans. Yeah, of that. and she she uh, messaged me no Facetime me about two weeks into it. She goes, "Oh, when does this detox period you know come out?" I'm like, "Detox? I'm like, what do you mean?" She's like, "Well, I got." I'm dizzy, you're getting headaches, it's got low energy. Like, I know you're supposed to detox when you're like, do you even listen to my show? You're my sister, you should listen to my <laughs> show. I'm like, you're not, that's not what happens. Detoxing is not what happens. I mean, there's a Herxheimer effect and I talked about dying bacteria. So that's not what's happening with you. I said, you're low sodium. And she's like, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, you were eating processed food before. Like, tell me what you were eating before. I said, here, let me send you a box. So I had Jerry mail her a box of Element and she, Element T, and she told me the next day, the very next day. Gone. She's like, I feel so, she's like, I feel so stupid that it was sodium. I feel so much better. Yeah. Awesome. So she, yeah. So I sent her a couple more boxes. Uh, that's why I think it's such a great partnership is because I do think that the community that we talk to, like the general population, you probably don't need to add salt to your diets. Yeah. All the prepackaged things. If you're, if you're health conscious and you're, you're doing your best to eat whole foods and very much so that could be a missing component. You have no idea. And, and it could be brain fog, could be headaches, could be low energy. Yep. Like mm -hmm. you'd be surprised, like the symptoms symptoms that you might be feeling you may have had no idea it's just simply sodium you need to fix yeah sure. so so uh the three-part train the trainer series is going to be coming out starting the 15th of this month and we're still signing people up uh it's free and we're teaching trainers how to build more successful businesses we're not charging anything we talked about this rolling in the podcast it's not a ponzi scheme, <laughs> it's not a ponzi it's scheme. MLM. Yeah. It's, uh, you are going to leave with very <laughs> valuable and in fact we picked the most valuable things in those three days that we're going to teach you. So sign up. It's mindpumptrainer.com. All right. Another reminder, in four days, I'm going to be teaching trainers and coaches how to build better businesses. Sign up at mindpumptrainer.com. All right. Back to the show. First question is from Ibrahim J20. In episode 2239, you discussed the timing of protein consumption. Do the same principles apply 
to water hydration. I typically hit my water intake goals by consuming half a gallon before noon. Is that adequate for hydration if I'm only drinking a few cups for the rest of the day? Okay, so uh, I'll answer the specific question, but first let's kind of answer the general one, which is first let's reference the studies. The studies showed that if you consumed a large bolus of protein in one sitting, that the amino acids would still be get you still get utilized for things like recovery and building, um, even if you consumed it all at once versus let's say spread out throughout the whole day. So the the argument used to be that if you consume too much at once, that a percentage of it would just get turned into energy um, through glycolysis, right? Glyconeogenesis, yeah. sorry, which is turning it into um, into glycogen. Well, they found that the study showed that. That's not true. You could eat a lot of your protein at once and not have to split it up. Now there's limitations to that, like digestion and how you feel. So I don't think this is very practical for a lot of people, but it did show you could do that with protein. Protein is not water. The water you consume, your body uses and utilizes very quickly and it's in and out of your body uh, very fast. Now, if you drink a lot of water all at once, will it meet hydration needs? Yes, because if you're slightly dehydrated, you'll make up for it relatively quick, although there is a limit. And I know this because when you look at athletes that try to make weight, and this is extreme, right? But they'll, they'll dehydrate themselves in extreme ways, in ways that people normally wouldn't, right? They'll put themselves in a sauna. They'll sweat you know, out a bunch of weight, trying to cut 5, 10, 15 pounds even to weigh in to go do a match or something like that. And when they rehydrate, they know they need to do it slowly. If they go all at once, they could get sick. It could be really bad. So that, So there's a limit to what you can do with that. Nonetheless, um, what'll probably happen if you don't drink a lot of water and then drink most of it is you're going to go through a period of a little dehydration and then being hydrated versus okay. having it throughout the day. How does it work though that our, cause our muscle bellies are a massive storage of water also. So you're not, it's Maybe not, you'll be slightly dehydrated and then hydrated is what'll happen. You know, you, you know, what's interesting is you got, we'll go back to evolution the, with the evolutionary theory. The protein study makes sense because the way we hunted, it wasn't like you could kill a small animal every three hours and eat it. It was like, I killed a buffalo, we ate the hell out of it, and then we got to wait for another successful kill. Water is not like that. Humans always live next to water. Always. Mm -hmm. We could not live far away from water. It just didn't work for us. We had, we, we, you, you can only go how long without water versus food. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a, a drastic difference. So um, I don't think that's a good idea. Uh, now this person, half a gallon before noon, then glasses throughout the rest Splitting of the day. Splitting hairs. You're probably okay. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. you know, if someone's like, I need to drink a gallon a day and I'll do that all in a two-hour period, uh, probably not a good idea. Yeah. You'll probably suffer negative ideal. negative effects of both sides, right? Of the drinking too much water, mm -hmm. throwing off electrolyte balance. It, it also would really Let's depend see. on what, what you're doing in those periods of time, too, to put the demand on the high, on, on the bottom. You're 100%. Yeah. That's very true. Like, what if before noon... They're sweating their ass off doing right. a bunch of, you know, uh, right. exercise or something. Right, right. Or you get your workout done early in the morning, you drink your full half gallon, you're probably fine, and then the rest of the day you're pretty sedentary. Pfft, not going to be a, a problem. Now, whatsoever. I know people who do this on purpose. So I, when I would train surgeons, they, when they would do these long procedures, oh, I so trained- they don't have to pee? Yeah. yeah. I trained this one woman. So this is, I mean, I try and do this. Like, oh, because that's why I don't like working out at late at night was because it's so hard to work out and not drink any water. Mm. And so I really try and front load my water and do as best I can to drink as little as possible. Because otherwise you pee. Otherwise. Several I times mean, a night. Yes. When you do that, do you still wake up at night to pee just once no. or something? If I, if I can discipline myself to really shut the water down towards the back half of the night, um, I can get a, a full night's rest. It's just hard. It's right. hard. It's like, it's it's hard for me to have no water, say after five o'clock at all or any liquid whatsoever. That's tough for me to do that. And so inevitably I end up having at least a glass or two or something of something. Right. And then that will inevitably get me up at least once, maybe twice. And then for sure, if I do like last night, last night I train later than I normally would, like at five or six o'clock at night. And i I drank like, you know, a liter of water or whatever like that. And then I'm up three yeah. times to go pee. But you need it because you were working out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, like I said, I trained this one woman. She, she was a, a remarkable surgeon. She did what's <laughs> called a Whipple procedure, which is like a 10-hour yeah. surgery. So you're in, you don't leave. You can't leave. No. Yeah. And I'm like, yes. what do you got to do if you, if, what do you, like, what if you got to pee? She's like, right. oh, I don't drink a water like leading up to it because otherwise you're screwed. You can't leave once you're scrubbed in and it's a very delicate procedure. So Yeah, it's gnarly. Yeah. Next question is from Lisa Carr Lack. 
Is there much evidence for the benefits of the meat and fruit diet, especially now in light of the new research on max protein utilization? Have any of you guys ever tried it? They used to call us paleo. Yeah. I mean, that's what paleo the, used to be. Used to be, yeah. Uh, was meat well, and maybe fruit. nuts in there, but you would throw some nuts in there. Yeah. Things that you could eat raw. And yeah. they, like, and they well, throw well, sweet potato in there too. That's later. It used to be no starch whatsoever. The original. Mm. Oh, period. really? Yeah. yeah. It was just oh, seeds. Yeah. Uh, even. Yeah. Yep. No seeds either. Yeah. It was like it was like some nuts. Be, okay, so here's the value of a diet like this, uh, and it's not for the average person, but um, it's low in food intolerances. Mm -hmm. So if you're somebody that suffers <laughs> from Lots of reactions. Maybe you have autoimmune issues, so your body's a bit hyper um, vigilant or hyper reactive to different foods. The foods that you're least likely to be reactive to mm -hmm. are fruits and meat. Vegetables you'll be reactive to. Grains you'll probably be reactive to. Dairy reactive to. Even eggs uh, and eggs yeah. can be reactive. But meat is very low and reactive, especially red meat. It's very bioavailable. Yeah, and and, and uh, fruit, because now people ask why, plants create defense It's like mechanisms. an offering. Yes, they want yeah, you to, to eat predators. the fruit. predators, yeah. They want you to eat the fruit because the fruit is what's got the seed, and you eat it, you poop out the seed, and then you make more plants. Uh, vegetables, oftentimes, no. They don't want you to eat like the stalk or the leaves because that'll kill the plant. So they mm -hmm. create... And there's a hormetic effect, by the way. Those of you that can eat vegetables, don't listen to what I'm saying and say, oh, I should not eat vegetables. No. You don't react to vegetables. What you're getting from those compounds that like these carnivore you know, advocates say is bad for you, you actually get a hormetic response. It's good for you. It's the same thing with exercising. I yes. Mean, otherwise, yeah, because honestly, like it, the recovery is where you're getting all the benefits. Yeah. And, you know, the actual uh, insult is, you know, the exercise, but it's necessary for you in order to grow. Yeah. So now, now, now for athletic performance, Unless you're somebody that is hyper reactive to food and this is what you can eat and not be reactive, in which case it'll be a great diet for you. But for everybody else, this is not a great muscle building or athletic performance diet. Like try to perform with the carbohydrates from fruit is tough. Starches do a better job, like rice, potato just does a better job. You're going to have more glycogen. You're going to have more power. Lots of studies have been undone on this. I've experienced it myself. Clients have experienced this. So unless you're one of those people that's hyper-reactive, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think this is a... Now, the average person, will they get healthy eating this? Probably. It's better than the standard American diet. It really has to do with adherence, right? If it's uh, all these diets, is is this something that you can do forever? Is it so, and, and enjoy doing that. And then the other thing to look at is... Whatever diet is that I'm following, it, if it's if it's limited, what do, what do I lose out on nutrient wise because I've limited that mm -hmm. right? So if you're going to do a diet like carnivore or vegan or paleo, you one okay is this something I like and I could do forever? Okay, check that box. Yes, I like it. I love just meat. I can just eat that. Okay, well, what am I missing out on that yeah. could either hinder performance or what micronutrients am I not that might not that might support my hair, my nails, my energy, all these other things? You have to look at the diet and go like, what is it missing that I'm now not getting? And be aware of the potential, uh, you know, downstream effects of not getting whatever said nutrient is. I think adherence in that are the two most important it's, things. What's interesting, what always fascinates me about this is that for <clears throat> most of human history, the foods that people avoided eating were the ones that would just kill them. So the, a diet in the for most of human history was poison, eat everything else. As long as it's not poison, <laughs> yeah. right, right. eat everything else. But now we're in a place where we yeah, can get- water. I mean, you it's, to drink beer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, yeah that's 100% true. Yeah, people you, will drink beer. The fermentation of, process just to kill off a lot of that It was bacteria. less likely to have you know uh, pathogens. Yeah. But uh, So it's, it's an interesting one for me. You can get away with it, but if unless, like I said, you're one of those people, like, like for what? Why? Next question is from Devin B. Baker. For people just getting started like myself, what makes MAPS so effective? How do we understand when to change it up? I'd like to know the science of how it works. MAPS programs are effective for the same reason why really good coaching programs that are developed by strength coaches or other experienced coaches are effective. And that's because it's based on a combination of experience and science. You have to have both if you're going to write a good workout program. I'll give you a great example. A study just came out. Lane Norton just talked about it on strength training. And in the study, they showed that training close to failure 
resulted in less strength gains than training be- way below failure, but doing more sets. So the study was comparing strength. And so he's like, and he's trying to explain it. And then underneath it, I commented, it said, the problem with these studies is they're done for like 18 weeks. And yep. is, uh, within the realm of reasonable, um, most things work with strength training. Nothing works forever. So that's why you have so many contradictory studies. Going to failure builds more muscle and strength. Wait a minute, this one over here shows that going away from failure and doing more sets, and then this one, oh, this one says low reps. Now this one says high reps. This one says lifting with speed is better. Oh, this one says time under tension is better. They all work. The body stops really responding if you do the same thing uh, for a long period of time. So, and that's, you don't learn that from studies, you learn that from experience. And so the MAPS programs, that's what we put in there. But there's a lot of moving parts. So when well, you- you're you're really looking at. I mean, imagine going to school and and learning from a teacher who has their degree and is very intelligent, knows how to teach the subject, whether it be math, language, whatever it is, uh, but is fresh out of college and is now teaching students for the first time. And then you have a teacher who's been teaching for forty years that same subject and has cha- taught it to hundreds, if not thousands, of students. And learned other things other than the the the, the right. formula and what they needed to know. Like right. a lot, there's a lot of of our peers that understand the studies and the formulas the same way that we do. There's not as many trainers and of our peers that have not only understand it from the studies, the schooling, but then also have trained thousands of people and have now learned to t- tease out like behavioral stuff and go, oh well, we know what the study says that here's a range of sets or reps or yeah. exercises that are ideal for the maximum results. But then we also know that 80% of people fall off here right. or don't do this or get hurt when they do that. Or, or is well, this too long of a time period where people only have slotted this much and they're, you're only going to keep their attention for this long. That's right. So what what you see with the mass program, and by the way, this isn't, it isn't a phenomenal just for beginners. It's phenomenal for anybody who's never really followed a good program or maybe have just followed their own program or followed somebody else's program. The reason why we've had so much success is that everybody across the board, no matter how experienced or not experienced you are, sees phenomenal results from that. And that's just because we have tra- trained a plethora of people in all age ranges, all experiences. And when we create things and we write programs, we don't just factor the science in. We also factor in our experience. How are you going to feel after you're done accomplishing this workout and then the combination of the exercises one before the other? And then, you know, and, and that, again, it's 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 points back to like earlier in, in the conversation we were talking about, you know, like uh, predicting a lot of these things ahead of time. I also think that, and this is why we knew we had a business on our hands, is for some weird reason, um, a majority of the people in our space are are speaking to or writing programs for a very niche uh, population, a, a very small percentage of the population. They're, they 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 speak to themselves or other fitness professionals, where that is not our experience. Our experience is with general population, and so we come from a place of like this is going to help most people. Like w- when we write something, we go like this is going to be best for most people where a lot of the the fitness professionals in our space they have written what works for them or, or you know work for their their athletes in spite or, of their terrible program yes it's, it's uh, okay i mean i'll stand by this all day long 90 plus percent of the workout programs in the market are have neither science nor experience are pure garbage just a slap together exercises together, make it look cool. Yeah. And the goal is, can we make it hard and make it exciting? Just a bunch of ice cream it, flavors. It just, it just <laughs> hey. uh, little inside joke there, yes. Craig. Uh, it's, uh, it's, they're just pure garbage. Okay. Probably 5%, I would say are based on real science. And these are the ones that are popular in strength, uh, sports. Mm-hmm. The reason why they're good is because you perform. Right. Like you're powerlifting, you're Olympic lifting, or whatever. Like your program There's sucks. Tangible evidence. Yes. The the other five percent are based off of science and experience. Those are very hard to find. There's very few of them um, that are out there. So it wasn't that hard to write a program that was really good. <laughs> that was better than the other ones because we're not competing with really good. But I'll give you an example of what you were talking about, Adam. You you were mentioning you know the, like all the things you need to consider. Okay. 
if you look at all the studies on uh, rep ranges, low reps, moderate reps, high reps, um, and there's different ways to phase your workouts. I'm just going to stick to reps because you could also do it with time periods, sets, volume, types of extra. I could I could go and run down a list and just confuse everybody. But let's stick to rep range, okay? Let's compare uh, workouts or phases with low reps, moderate reps, high reps. You won't find a single study that shows that it's better or worse to mix the rep ranges up in workouts throughout the week versus sticking to a rep range for four weeks and then moving to another one. Okay. It's all the same in terms of results. However, it's not because here's what we've learned. When you take people and you have them do low rep, moderate rep, high rep every single week, they don't, there's a different mindset, a different feel mm -hmm. that goes into each of those rep ranges. When I lift low reps, I'm not trying to feel the muscle. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to feel the movement. I'm trying to maximize force. It's a completely different feel than when I'm going moderate reps and feeling the muscle and Too squeezing. Too many psychological pump, shifts. Which is a very different feel than high reps where I'm trying to make it through the damn set and it's stamina and I'm breathing hard. It's a completely different mindset. And the average person, if you you keep them in one of those because they learn it and by the, week, by, by the second and third week, they're performing that rep range better. Mm -hmm. If you mix it up all the time, they end up not really picking it up. It takes too long. So yeah, the studies show it doesn't matter, but we know through experience that it matters. So that's just one example. Yep. Next question is from OMG. It's Danny D. <laughs> What's your guy's opinion on high intensity training, like how Mike Menser preached and then how Dorian Yates perfected? Oh, I mean, great follow-up I mean, question. Sal's yeah. talked about this a million times. Love yeah, this. I know, okay. a bunch of times. I love this. Okay, so uh, Mike Menser, his program was called Heavy Duty. Dorian Yates did a program called Blood and Guts. Uh, Mike Menser's training was based off of the teachings of Arthur Jones, the inventor of Nautilus, Nautilus equipment. And the theory was that once you put this, once you set the gears in motion for muscle growth, once you set the stimulus, any further signal would just Im impair recovery, slow down the process. And so then the question was, well, how do we know we send the signal effectively? Well, make it as intense as possible. So what they did is they said, okay, instead of doing, because at the time when Arthur Jones was was studying this, it was in the late 60s, sorry, 70s. It was in the 70s. At that time, the popular bodybuilding workouts were like high volume. So like Arnold would do what are called double split routines, 20 sets per body part, get a pump. You know, you know, he's going in there, he's doing biceps for 45 minutes to an hour type of deal. Arthur Jones said, no, one set to failure and beyond is what you do and then you leave it alone. So now the body can grow and build muscle and that stuff. And he tested it. And what they found was in short periods of time, it worked. People built a lot of muscle, a lot of strength. This is true. If you follow this style of training in a short period of time, you by will the, see rapid gains. By the way, this, this question feeds perfectly into the last question. Correct. I mean, because this is what you're explaining right now is a perfect example of where just... Just a valid method. Yeah. And, and then also that there's other variables. And so... Yes, this is a tool. Yes, we could write a program that's 100% based off of that. But then there's other factors that come into play. And even if that does work, it comes to a point where it doesn't work as well. Never. Three months later. Not mm -hmm. even three months. So you'll, you'll get really fast, short-term results, burn out real quick, and then go backwards. That's what ends up happening yep. when, the, when most people train this way. It's very, very rare outliers like Dorian who could continue training this way. But this just, that's just how it is for this kind of, this is why it's not the predominant way of training, but this is also why people will do it and then preach about it. Cause they'll be like, Oh my God, I got more straight yeah. gains in three yeah. weeks than so. Uh, but in the, by the way, it's not appropriate for most people taking a set to failure and beyond is such an inappropriate level of intensity for most people because their form breaks down and it's just stupid. I would never train 95% of my clients in this way, even with me watching them. Okay. Nonetheless, um, I, figured this out and we all got together and wrote a program that utilized and took advantage of this effect in a long program. And it essentially alternates between this style of training and other styles of training with deload weeks to maximize its effects and minimize its negatives. So if you want to be able to maximize those short-term gains, but like stay away from what ends up happening, which is you hit a wall and go backwards, um, maps anabolic advanced, uh, utilizes failure training in this way, but does it in a way to where, you know, you do the program for three or four months and you don't end up experiencing what everybody experiences when they do this, which is terrible, burnout. terrible, terrible burnout. Look, uh, we have a training course coming up three days, starts January 15th for trainers and coaches. 
We're going to teach you how to get leads, how to close big deals, how to be more successful with your clients and more. Go sign up at mindpumptrainer.com. It's totally free. Mindpumptrainer.com. You can also find all of us on social media, on Instagram. Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at mindpumpdestefano. And Adam is at mindpumpadam. <laughs>